Conspiratorial Conversations. Thank you all for being here. This member series was created exclusively for Fry Art Museum members and special guests to listen, learn, and engage with curators, artists, and the creative community around us. In conjunction with the recent opening of the third meeting, Esther Sarah installs the Fry Collection, we're excited to welcome Interim Director and Chief Curator Amanda Donnan in conversation with Dee Graham Burnett and Joanna Fiducia of Esther Sarah. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples who have since time immemorial stewarded the lands and waters of this place we now call Seattle. Please join me in offering gratitude and respect to their elders past and present, as well as future generations of their stewardship. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amanda Donnan, Fry Interim Director and Chief Curator and co-conspirator to the guest curators of the third meeting Esther Sarah installs the Fry Collection. Amanda? Thanks, Victoria. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in wherever we find you in the world. Um, I'm honored to be joined this evening by Dee Graham Burnett and Joanna Fiducia, who are the curatorial leads for the collection exhibition, The Third Meaning, uh, and are here representing a much larger international research collective called Esther Serre. Dee Graham Burnett works at the intersection of historical inquiry and artistic practice. Based in New York, Burnett trained in the history and philosophy of science at Cambridge and teaches at Princeton. He's the author of a number of books and his essays, pseudonymities and metafictions have appeared in Cabinet, where he is an editor, October, Parquet, and elsewhere, including the catalog of the 55th Venice Biennale. He's been involved with Esther Serra for about a decade now. Joanna Fiducia is an art historian, art critic, and assistant professor in the Department of the History of Art at Yale University. She's the author of Figures of Crisis, Alberto Giacometti, and the Myths of Nationalism, forthcoming from Yale University Press, as well as scholarship and criticism published in October, Art History, Parquet, Spike Art Quarterly, and Art Forum. A founding co-editor of the journal Apricata and a collaborator with the Friends of Attention, her writing has also appeared in a number of catalogs and essay collections. She too has been collaborating with Esther Serra for many years now. So uh, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guests, Joanna and Graham, both of whom we at the Fry have discovered to be incredibly engaging, dynamic speakers. Um, the two of them have actually prepared a presentation on the concerns and commitments of Esther Serra and on the very special exhibition project um, that the collective devised for the Fry Art Museum. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, I really do hope you'll visit as many people have um, multiple times already. It's such a delightful and thought provoking show um, that I think will forever change the way you see the Fry's collection. And it'll be on view till October 15th, 2023. So you do have plenty of time. Um, so I'm basically just going to stand out of the way and let these two talk for about the next 30, 40 minutes, uh, and I'll come back in at the end to facilitate the Q&A. So take it away, Joanna. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda. Graham and I have really been looking forward to this occasion to reflect on this exhibition and this aims together, and it has been uh, extraordinarily promising, rewarding, uh, and and enlightening project to work on with the entire team together. Um, so as, as Amanda already said, but it bears repeating again, Graham and I are longtime collaborators in a collective of artist researchers named Estar Serre, a group that is both um, passionately interested and has an abiding concern for the history and the future of attention. So what we thought that we'd do tonight is that um, in a moment, uh, I will kind of pass over the mic to Graham, who will speak a bit about this exhibition. We took the helm, but it really is the yield of a much larger set of thinkers and makers who've been working in concert together over many years. Um, and after Graham says a bit about Esther Serre, its its aims and how we thought about this exhibition, um, I'll then give us a little bit of a, a virtual lead, th lead through the exhibition, stopping at a few vital moments in it that we think uh, condense some of the main features of the exhibition together. Um, so with that, Graham, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you uh, so much. My sound coming through okay, everybody? Great. 
Um, yeah, so just to start off by saying thank you to everybody at the Fry, Amanda in particular, and everybody who helped this uh, exhibition come together. And Joe and I have a slightly difficult thing to try to do. We want to give you a bit of a feel for how this exhibition looks and in a way also how it works. So somewhere between um, lifting the the hood uh, and uh, enticing that visit that we hope lots of you will make uh, to see the show. So maybe um, next slide. Yeah, so that initial image that you saw in the title slide is the fry trunk. And if you were in Seattle right now and in the museum and that museum were open and you were walking into our show, you would find yourself first in this room and you confront that installation object, that mysterious collation of quirky doodads that is uh, the fry trunk. And uh, in a moment, Joe is going to take you down in the galleries that are to your left as you look at this moment and walk you through those spaces, and uh, you'll get a chance to see everything. But I'll lead by saying that this is an artist curated exhibition. So Estar Serre, um, an acronym that stands for the Aesthetical Society for Transcendental and Applied Realization, now incorporating the Society of Aesthetic Realizers, that mouthful, Estar Serre, is a group of researchers who are concerned in a general way, as Joe said, with attention, with the history of attention, with the history of practices of attention, the ways and the places and the modes in which human beings have given radical attention to objects. Um, and while this exhibition, as you'll see, has a sort of slightly archaicizing energy, it has some throwback stuff going on. It looks a little like it's a collection of older objects. Um, it's really important to lead by saying that this is a show that reaches back into the history of attention for now and for the future, which is to say this work can look untimely, but it is immensely preoccupied with our current attentional situation, a situation in which I think many of us feel we are newly set upon by a project that is commodifying our attention, that is turning eyeballs, our own eyeballs, our ability to put our senses and mental focus where we want, turning that into a way to make money uh, in the marketplace. Um, and everybody who's associated with Estar Serre is especially focused on how we can seize radical attention and push back against those push downs of commodification. So uh, let me take you now to that wall text and give you a sense of how things would be um, set up. So Estar Serre, I've said, worries about attention in general, and that's true. But Estar Serre is particularly concerned with a cohort of radical attention aughts, payers of attention across time uh, that we call, that is called uh, the order of the third bird. And the order of the third bird, we can think about as uh, a kind of trans-historical community of uh, intense givers of attention. We're concerned with that third thing that happens between uh, the person and the object. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you now where they get their name from and how it is that this show is kind of built around the effort to excavate that history of this community of our forefighters in radical attention. So uh, reading on the wall text that is uh, before you, you'll see, if you could, the following. So I'm reading the text that's there. An ancient tale tells of an artist who once painted a child carrying a bunch of grapes. That image was so lifelike 
that the birds flocked around the canvas to peck at its fruit. But even then, the painter wasn't satisfied. If the child had been more realistic, he reasoned, the birds would have been too frightened to approach. Determined to fix this defect, he reworked the painting and set it outside. Then he watched as three birds drew near. The first glimpsed the child and fled. The second tried to eat the illusory grapes. But that third bird simply landed in front of the painting and looked at it in perfect stillness for a very long time. And that third bird is a little bit the avatar of this cohort of payers of radical attention in community. And it's that community with which Esther Serre is particularly concerned. Um, and if I can get the next slide, I'll just say quickly that Esther Serre has worked through a body of archival sources that bear on the history of this fugitive community of radical attention odds. Next slide. And what Esther Serre does is it surfaces historicity, the historicity of those communities. It works on the past of those communities. And that book that you see on your left, which was published um, about a year ago now, uh, gathers a set of those articles. The uh, pamphlets you see on the right are the work of Estar Serra over the last years. And next slide. We've actually prepared, uh, and this is a little video that runs through kind of the library of our work with those little pamphlets and then these publications over the last several years of our scholarship on radical attention as paid by these birdish folks. And this is the catalog that was prepared for this exhibition discussing radical attention in Seattle in particular, communities of radical attention in Seattle. And that's the fry trunk with all those objects, each one of which from the trunk gets a little moment in the sun in that catalog. Next slide. Um, there's the trunk. And now to let you see what happens if you were in front of that trunk and able to turn left, I give you back to Joe. Thanks, Graham. All right, so as you pivot out from looking at the trunk, you enter into the exhibition space. Um, and one thing, that we found while looking in the trunk was a, a strange, maybe I'll go back for a moment, um, a, a strange piece of music that seemed to um, suggest a kind of practice of attending or experiencing in threes, which for us became a springboard for how we wanted to go about curating the collection. Um, so when you walk into the first major gallery, we wanted every viewer there to be seized immediately by the sense that in these galleries, all artworks are hung in what we call triadic gatherings, or really just groups of three, a strong threeness energy to it. And the first um, triad as you enter in into this area um, is this one here. And the reason that we wanted to launch uh, launch our viewers into the exhibition with this triad is because it thematizes really that basic act that every museum goer, which is to say looking. This is a series of three works that are about seeing. They are reflections on reflection. So to look at them a bit more closely, um, the first work, you see here on the left uh, is Gabriel von Max is a German artist, um, Seifenblasen or soap bubbles from 1881. Um, beside it, a rondel uh, by David McGranigan, uh, a 1984 work, a self-portrait. And then on the floor here uh, is a work by the Cree artist Wayne Linklater um, called Trap from 2016. And so, if, so far as this is a triad that's really about seeing, we wanted to think about how these three works put together stage at the same time, um, three possibilities for imagining uh, what it might be to look at art itself. Do we think of it in something like the, the Von Max here on the left, a moment of self-regard looking at what other people have made in which what passes before our eyes is something as uh, perhaps magical but fleeting as a soap bubble? Is it an act of looking at the self that in fact gathers the world around it 
as we see in the David McGranigan, um, or is it something perhaps a bit more sinister? Is it uh, a moment of narcissism that in fact turns into the trap that Dwayne Linklater here is a mirror that's mounted to a piece of dismantled gallery wall that's been placed on the ground and laid across it uh, is a painted bear trap. Um, what was very important for us in putting together this exhibition is that there's no one answer to how these works might fit together, but perhaps a kind of passage from one to the other. So something like the soap bubbles, spherical nature, the globular shape of that bubble then gets taken up in the rondelle of David McGranigan's self-portrait whose mirror-like reflection then becomes the basis for Linklater's trap. Um, our hope is that in something like this, the, the passage of shape to shape or reflection to reflection would do something like lay out a, a shape itself for the kind of attention we're hoping that this exhibition will solicit. And that is something that itself might feel rather spherical or even vertiginous. Uh, something in which the thoughts and sensations that you might have before these works would be put into circulation um, or even set spinning. So I want to back out for a moment just to show you again another feature of this exhibition. So you'll notice that um, to the left here, there is a, a little inset. Um, and Graham, would you want to speak to, to what's going on in this place here? Yeah, you know, um, Joe and I had the great privilege of doing a walkthrough in the exhibition with um, so many of the staff and folks who uh, helped the show come together and then the educators and others. And um, without sort of being in front of all of you who are out there in space, it's a little hard to know if we're able to give you fully the feel for how these rooms work. But um, feel those threes because the wager of the show is that there is a kind of attention that happens when things are gathered in threes. Uh, and yes, we find that proposition in the trunk, in the documents that we uh, suspect may have birdish ties, but the show works. And when you get there, and I hope each of you will have a chance to go, it works because as you stand in front of a group of three, there's a thing that happens as you work the relations. Uh, just as uh, Joe said, in circles, in sequences of uh, comparison, um, there's a way in which, a little like that third bird, one is, we think, brought up short and stopped by uh, the problem that's presented in a triadic gathering. Now, uh, Joe uh, signaled over in the extreme left there, there's a little lovely red inset box and uh, Shane and the others in the, uh, on the installation side made these little vitrines that house some of the objects from the trunk. Now that trunk is a gathering of objects um, that we read, we interpret, in that catalog that was shown in the video as the material of birds in the Pacific Northwest, in the Seattle area, we think of it as a trove of sources that speak to radical attention in and around Seattle over the last century. And that object, which has spilled out of the trunk, the trunk had a slightly clown car-like quality uh, as we worked so hard to open it and take the objects out and catalog them, do proper conservation work with them. Uh, we found that uh, we kept having trouble figuring out how everything could fit back into that trunk. Um, and so it hasn't been possible to present everything back in the trunk. And those things that uh, have felt like excess or surplus have been located at strategic uh, positions in the gallery. And this is a mirror device. It's called a manometric flame analyzer. And it's a piece of laboratory hardware from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, uh, their use is so poetic and extraordinary. Um, it was the first technology that permitted the translation of sound, music, or voice 
directly into a visual image. So the exact way it did that, I could get into if you have questions, um, but these were developed in the German lens in the second half of the 19th century. And by spinning that mirrored cube before a little Bunsen burner flame that had a diaphragm in it that was responsive to sound waves in a room, you could actually produce something that looked a little like the readout from the oscilloscope uh, that was the graphic representation of speech or music in the room. So we think of this device as uh, kind of an early technology of synesthesia and itself uh, a kind of listener in the conversation that happens in the triadic gathering of which uh, Joe just spoke. And uh, these are some other objects uh, that are in those little vitrines, trunk objects, uh, a, uh, an actual uh, oscilloscope over on the right, uh, which reads out its little green line, and which we think was used in certain attentional practices that involved looking at the graphical readout itself on the screen, an early kind of screen practice of vigilance. And we write a little bit about that in the catalog. A set of game pieces, um, strangely assorted with mechanical doll eyes, those animatronic eyes that could close when a doll is uh, pitched past 45 degrees. And we write a little bit in the catalog about the history of uh, that kind of doll and what it exactly meant that there was a sudden historical interest in uh, this gesture that could create a sense of sleep automatically. And then the third object in the lower left is an object that uh, you, one could think of it as site specific in the sense that it's an object that has its own ties to the Fry collection um, in a way that turned out to be interesting for us as we worked through the objects in the trunk and began to suspect that there had been a kind of a history of radical attention in and around the Fry uh, since its founding and uh, inception, but more on that as we as we keep talking. And thank you, Graham, for kind of reminding us to slow down a bit on the on the nature of the the triad and why we felt so interested in this. Um, there is, of course, a rich intellectual history of thinking in thirds that we could speak more about in the Q and A. Um, but one of the reasons that it interested us is because it seemed that uh, the, the trio is infinitely more complex than the, the duo, which tends to fall into a set of binary oppositions, um, whereas threes open up um, to a whole other set of relations that we were interested in offering to the visitors. Um, so one of them that we thought we'd, we'd also pause on this evening um, is this work, this, uh, this triad here. Um, on the left is Isaac Lehman, a 2011 untitled print. Um, in the center is a work by the Seattle-based performance collective Implied Violence, The Small Ether Machine. Um, and on the right is the American Impressionist painter Lillian Gentz, uh, Sun Maiden which is a work from around 1909. Uh, one way of looking at this would be something like a narrative, if not even a cause and effect, a self uh, etherizing gesture that then produces or emits the, the vision of the sun maiden on the right. Uh, but we also thought of this triad as being something almost emblematic of the kind of imaginative work that we hope might be unleashed by placing works in these rather startling exhibitions. Um, so it bears saying, uh, Graham is a historian of science, I'm an art historian. Uh, the work of contextualizing something inside of its historical moment is really our bread and butter. Um, but for both of us, really for Estar Ser, the collective of which we're a part, there's another dimension to paying attention to things, and in particular, perhaps paying attention to artworks that outstrips or moves far outside of its particular historical moment, and that might call upon some kind of dreamlike energy or some solicitation to enter into an oneric space to really unlock and to be a bit more concrete about that. Um, 
there are, of course, many things in our immediate context that condition how we look at artworks and how we go about making objects in our own life. Um, at the same time, there are many other influences that might be a book that you read or a story you remember or a strange thing that happened some years ago that string along into your life and enter in in these moments of encounter with objects or with materials. Um, and artworks in particular might be just that category of object that has as one of its ambitions to loft itself out of its context to attempt to attach itself to those pieces of being inside history that seem to slide a little bit outside of the particular historical pinpoints. So artworks are the things maybe that, um, that are capable of uh, flitting free from the historical pinpoints we might put to them. Um, so this is one reason why we wanted to create a structure that would allow us as viewers to get a little bit outside of the way we might generally encounter artworks as particular movements in particular geographical regions. Uh, and work, uh, a triad like this, we hope, um, really sets going that kind of dreamlike energy. Hey, uh, yeah, go you know, ahead. I wonder if it wouldn't make sense. I mean, you know, I'm going off script a bit here, but I'm going to suggest we just let people look at this one in silence for a little bit and see uh, what happens. Would that be okay with you, Joe? Let's do it. Shall we? Why don't I even go ahead and just uh, see if this works, but I'll ring a chime and why don't we take oh, uh, 30 seconds or so just to look. We don't know quite how birds look when they look, but if we were, why don't, why don't we just See what it's like just to look at this in silence for 30 seconds. Well, thanks for letting us uh, run that little experiment. One of our hopes, I think, is that in departing from some of the ways that we might encounter works uh, in a uh, historically responsible form of installation, we can also permit new ways of looking at them um, that that might include lingering a bit longer than it might seem normal in front of an artwork, um, doing so also in a certain kind of community that can feel rare. Something I think that's felt very pleasurable about being inside of the exhibition since it's been installed um, are the conversations that we've been able to eavesdrop on that have taken place in front of these works. Um, I think uh, that might be a segue to looking at one other work. If we if we do hope that some of the triadic gatherings bring us into a sense of um, of mystery or of the dream, other ones feel a little more straightforwardly playful. Um, so this one 
to speak of the conversation, um, this uh, this this is a kind of uh, an interesting play on the form of the triadic gathering. Um, and I'll just take us into this this painting that's right here. Um, this is a portrait of Mrs. Greathouse, um, who is uh, really one of the main forces behind the collection um, from uh, 2004 by Delgish. Um, and this is something that we came upon um, in storage. So one of the things that Esther Serre does is attempt to remain as attuned as possible to its context, um, to be site specific insofar as we are interested not just in a history of attention in a, in a broad sense, but also as it as it emerges or percolates out of specific settings. So in this case, um, attention in the Pacific Northwest and perhaps attention in the Fry. And it just seemed too delicious that this um, ready-made triad was there waiting for us inside of this portrait. Um, so behind Mrs. Greathouse, uh, there's, a Mar uh, there's a Mary Cassatt here that's on the right. Um, Little Eve uh, in the middle, Sergei Bongart's um, portrait of Walter Greathouse. And then on the left is William Harnett's uh, wooden basket of grapes from 1876. Uh, and so this seemed to us an occasion to really think about collecting itself, the collection as a particular form of attention that ha perhaps might have within it a bit of unexpected history to this peculiar mode of attention that we are attempting to draw out in the threes. Um, and then as you uh, turn your back to this portrait of Mrs. Greathouse, you find on the other wall that triad here so that you can sit inside of the conversation chair to give you a sense. So this is in one direction and in the other. Um, and you can take up her posture or you can perform her depending. Um, Graham, I don't know if you have more things you want to say about how this triad is working for you. Um, one of the fun things about hanging the show is just letting museum goers do what they will. And it has been notable that, uh, that a gossip chair, which is... Uh, as Fry folks will know, a kind of touchstone of the Fry collection uh, going way back. So um, we pulled those out of the out of the basement where they were temporarily and, and brought brought it back up. And you see both Mr. and Mrs. Greathouse are sitting uh, in exactly that chair. It was more than a little uh, suspicious to us that this triadic gossip chair was such a feature of the Fry's collection. And it was to us more than a little uncanny that Mrs. Greathouse chose to have her portrait painted with her back turned to a triad. Because one of the things that we we think we've figured out about the birds is that not only do they gather to pay attention, but that one of the phases of their form of attention involves actually looking away um, and then turning back and looking again after looking away. And so we have even allowed ourselves to dream that Mrs. Greathouse herself may have been birdish and that she may here have chosen to have her portrait painted as she is, in fact, in that phase of birdish non-attention, negation, in relation to the triad that is uh, behind her. So that's speculative, to be sure, uh, although it is the case um, that in at least one place, Mrs. Greathouse is known to have referred to herself, and we write about this in the catalog, as, quote unquote, a tough old bird. Um, and we wondered if she wasn't um, in a sense, leaving a trail of clues for those who would follow after. An open question for us. One other way that we thought about uh, working inside of the collection was to use this as an opportunity um, to do something else that the, the birds seem to really privilege, which is not just to pay sustained um, attention to works of art, but also to distribute that attention, perhaps more justly, letting it fall more heavily on things that are around us, especially artworks that may have escaped 
notice that may in fact be yearning for some kind of attention they are not quite getting. Um, so in this, this triadic gathering, which faces you as you enter into the main gallery in the far back wall, um, there's uh, three works here. Um, Hank Penders, uh, Before the Night, uh, and in the center here, I'll just show you so you can see up close, um, a very small Otto Scheuer's um, Foul, and then next to it, on this side here, um, Julius Scheuer's Brothers, um, Peacock from 1907, um, which as you may note, uh, is uh, hung in a rather uh, non-conventional manner upside down. Um, the key for it being that there's one other object, which you can see right here, um, which as you approach, uh, gives you the image here turned right side up, but itself now rendered triadic. So this is in fact another of the objects that's uh, uh, overflow from the trunk itself and uh, wonderful SR Serre researcher, Justin Ginsberg, who is himself a glass artist was uh, so generous and skilled in working with us to bring uh, this unusual artifact to, to light and to attention and to focus here. Um, and we write at some length about these this trefoil looking glass again in the catalog uh, and notice that it has the power not only to invert a given object, but to take any single object and present it triadically. So this is sort of a triadic ready-made. If you had a trefoil looking glass in your pocket, you could turn any situation into a triad and find oneself entranced in the possibility of that threefold gathering. Uh, so again, with uh, with some very skilled help from the uh, exhibition and installation folk, uh, a stand was created that lets this object actually be used. And it does have a slightly crystal ball energy, um, as will be uh, obvious when you look at it. We may be coming toward uh, the end of this sort of walk through part of things. Um, but I would maybe, and Joe may have some last things uh, she wants to throw in before we turn to Q&A. But I, I thought it might be worth saying um, that just as we've come to understand that the birds think of every work of art as a kind of reified request for attention, as a solicitation for attention made into a thing. And therefore, it seems, uh, think that there's always a kind of low hum of uh, a cry of sorts from all the works in the world that are not getting uh, the attention that they uh, hanker after, uh, that there's a kind of perpetual attentional crisis, given that the number of works of art wildly um, outnumber the numbers of uh, humans available to pay attention to them. So that's something of how it seems the birds play their game as sort of paramedics of attention in the world. So too, the folks from Astar Serre kind of have come to feel that museums are like special repositories of practices of attention. And I think it's worth saying that, that this whole show um, um, reaches toward the museum as a kind of special cathedral of durational attention. Whether art museums are still places to receive instruction in a canon of great works of art, whether museums as um, repositories of plunder from the you know history of uh, colonialism, whether those kinds of understandings of museums remain viable, that's a question. But at a moment where we're in such urgent need of a rethinking of our attentional lives and the role that attention plays in the process of self-making, in the process of relationship making, and in the work of care for the earth and for each other, um, I think Estar Serre folks think that museums have a special role to play, uh, given that they have been 
meaningful places where attention has been practiced um, going back a good long way. And so it's that aspect, I think, of um, the special history of places like the Fry that the show works to try to activate in a special way. If uh, Joe doesn't want to throw anything else in there, Amanda, um, you did so much to make all this uh, happen and we've had such fun working with you over the last couple of years as it's come together. What do you think? What have we left out? How does it sound? Well, I mean, I think it's worth saying that I, I think this is, although Esther Serre has been invited several times before to engage in art exhibitions, um, with sort of actions or performances. This is, I believe, your first sort of curatorial outing. Um, and so, and then with the triadic sort of conceit that you came up with for this, it is sort of a meta reflection on the act of curating in that gathering groups of objects together for looking is sort of the uh, quintessential act of curating. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what what you learned or what, uh, if this kind of redirected the trajectory for Esther Sarah at all, you think? Mm. Joe, um, should, we, should we drop the, um, the PowerPoint and- um, Let's do maybe, it. Yeah, maybe we can reopen it if we need to, but- um, Can we just have our faces here? It's such a great, uh, it's such a great question and mm -hmm. there is, uh, very definitely a sense in which the triadic gathering is sort of the degree zero of curatorial gesture, right? I mean, um, uh, and and that's in the mix of the project, to be mm -hmm. sure. But um, Joe, maybe uh, maybe we have put the question in your direction. Um, mm -hmm. Thoughts on what we've uh, what we've learned? Maybe you and I working on this as leads, and and then the larger question of like what it's been like for Esther Sarah as a collective. Uh, that's fun to speak to too. But why don't you mm -hmm. shoot? I mean, I'd say one of the. Uh there's there's a moment of um, great expansion when you are able to look at a collection this um, this heterogeneous this uh, this expansive and this odd in many ways um, and then uh, and then a moment of contraction when you have to decide what it is that you're going to um, to bring in and when there isn't a limiting principle that would be more conventional, say a, a particular um, a iconography or a, a particular time period or a particular artist, um, then that that limiting principle itself feels very charged. And I think something that uh, that maybe we we learned as we were doing it is that um, it it itself makes clear just how the very act of beginning to make groupings, beginning to kind of select and try and find conversations um, uh, can bring out um, very unexpected things. I think that there were a lot of triads that seemed initially intuitive um, and only afterward revealed their, their perhaps somewhat private logic to each of us individually. Um, and I think one of one of the things that seems exciting about doing this kind of work as a star ser is that um, it allows us to set in motion some of that um, initially intuitive and, and gradually unfolding logic that I think is un underneath a lot of a lot of the collective writing and thinking that we've done, and then leave it out there in the world for other people to come upon even in our absence. That seems really energizing, that there's a kind of thought that seems um, to be carried by these gatherings of works that doesn't need us necessarily present to animate it, um, that that can continue to uh, to be active in this space without us, um, and can also continue to unfold um, via all of these other people's attention as they come into it. So that that feels like um, something that seems quite quite different, um, having gotten the opportunity to do this kind of exhibition. Yeah, and I would say two things. I would say working with Joe has been. Uh, immensely gratifying and uh joe and i are, are really very old friends at this point um uh, probably coming up on on close to 10 years uh and uh joe is a very very brilliant person and 
um, has a very particular kind of feel for the work as, as an object, uh, a physical thing that's in space and what it means to constellate uh, works in space. Uh, and uh, she pushed very hard and I learned a lot. Uh, I'm easier <laughs> to please, I would say, in some basic ways. So that more than once, I was like, I love it, it's perfect. Boom, we're done. <laughs> and more than once, Joe was like, not quite. And I had my sort of like, all right, all right, whatever. Um, but, but then I would also say that there's just a huge amount of organizing humans because you're talking to the two of us, but there were probably 17 or 18 people from four countries, all of whom contributed conceptually in the um, interpretation of the trunk and in the visioneering of the project. And uh, there was the Fry Trunk Committee who worked hard on that object that you saw and its contents. And so, um, that work, like the work on this this big book that we love and that we always love when when uh, the catalog that we've held up is available in the in the fry, uh, as is the book, uh, this book, which was again, you know, a chunk of work, working with other people so closely is really intense. And and Amanda, what you said is absolutely true. Um, as to our our primary collaborative mode has been the performance lecture, which is how we first met you at the Sao Paulo Biennial in 2018. Uh, and in that format of the lecture that has a participatory attentional component, we've done stuff lots of places, Manifesta, Kochi, um, MoMA PS1, Guggenheim, but actually like installing a bunch of stuff. Uh, the only other time we did that was a, in, in this sort of way, was a, a small show at uh, Palo de Tokyo, um, that was temporary, and then again, a, a, a small show at, um, in connection with the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. So this was a big, big step for us. Well, I could go on with more questions, but there are two in the Q&A that I will read. Um, and I think this is a good segue from what you were just saying. Todd Rosine asks, first an observation, Esther Serre anagrams to assert her, a person most often seeking attention. My question is about your collective. What is its structure and process for making art? Hmm. Graham, do you want to speak to that? Um, can do. I think we we uh, it feels a little bit like uh, like a circus at sometimes. Um, as our Sarah's structure is pretty acephalous, headless in practice although histrionically institutional in appearance. So for instance, we have actually um, here at Manic Contemporary, so I'm speaking to you from Manhattan, um, just across the Hudson at Manic Contemporary, Esther Sir currently has uh, an installation that is called the Milcom Memorial Reading Room and Attention Library. There's a board of trustees there are uh, honorary overseas fellows, there are regular meetings uh, at that space. And that mood sort of pataphysical, reaching back to that sense of association or um, using many of the forms of a kind of elaborate academicism, um, as well as the kind of Borgesian encyclopedism of this book project and our other publications, that's all part of the mood of the thing. And practically, uh, that does mean that there's um, lots of organizational work, but very, very practically, um, there were perhaps 10 people in the group who could like initiate projects by having a contact with a curator and then undertaking to assemble a team that would work on a given uh, performance opportunity or a gallery or installation opportunity. That's how we worked uh, on our publications and on um, stuff like this in the past. That's so does that, Joe, am I leaving aspects yeah. of all that out? Does that feel right? Yeah, so. The next uh, is a comment more. It says, thank you so much for your time and words and for the wonderful exhibit. I have no questions, but a quote from a book about the number three. 
Throughout human history, the number three has always had a unique significance, but why? The ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras postulated that the meaning behind numbers was deeply significant. In their eyes, the number three was considered as the perfect number, the number of harmony, wisdom, and understanding. Anything you want to reflect back about that? That's really lovely. I mean, we, uh, we did a, we had some, we had a quite good time as we often do looking through uh, the longer history of threes and thirds um, and in general kind of triadic organizations of, of thought. Um, and one, one idea I think that, that struck us was by the psychoanalyst and Jessica Benjamin, who writes about the position of the third, which seems to me to have a kind of oblique relationship to the perfection um, of, of threes that, that is in that quote. Um, for her, the position of the third um, would be the place that we can occupy in relation with others where we suspend um, our desire to set aside differences or, or to, to understand our roles, to um, conceptualize ourselves as subjects for whom others are objects, um, but rather to attempt to be inside that that in between place with others, um, and that that might be a space not just perhaps of um, confusion or a loss of boundaries, but could also be one of of balance and equilibrium. Seems like it's inside of there, but it's true that the the three and the third um, has uh, itself a kind of manifold understanding throughout the last um, many centuries of thought. Graham, I don't know if you have other things you want to say to that. There's a really fun bit um, in in a, a different Graham. I'm Graham, but there's a, um, a more famous philosopher person named Graham Harmon. And Graham Harmon's book, The Quadruple Object, has a funny short essay. I mean, it's serious, but he's a playful philosopher on the sort of philosophical valence of numbers one through four. So he takes a moment to talk about what kinds of philosophies you end up with if you start with one, various holisms and monisms. Then the philosophies you end up with if you like two, um, obviously um, conflictual, dyadic. Um, what you end up with um, if you are into threes, where there's an element of mediation in some kind of dyadic conflictual encounter. And then as it happens, his preferred philosophical number, which is fours, um, where you think of um, Heidegger and uh, the fourfold and uh, two tensions and the delicious crossings that occur when you have a pair of tensions. Um, so uh, there's also, you know, we canvassed our thirds, our title, the third comma, meaning riffs on a famous essay by Roland Barthes that we discussed a little bit in the um, exhibition essay that's in the brochure for those of you who make it out and can pick it up, although it's also online. Uh, and uh, Barthes' theory of the third is essentially hermeneutic. It's concerned with interpretation and it's a, it's a kind of meaning. It is indeed uh, a meaning that is neither the kind of um, plain sense meaning nor the symbolic meaning. And hence one gets a sense that it's it's the meaning that can prick or be kind of um, uh, emergent, uh, free floating. Um, and uh, we put the comma in there so that ours is a little bit more like, and then, uh, but, um, but whether it's, Wisdom exactly, I, I wouldn't be quite sure, but Bars is definitely about understanding, the third as the number of understanding. I think that you kind of got to Ken Allen's question, does the process of seeing in threes in the exhibition suggest ways of seeing or perhaps teach us to attend in new ways outside of the museum context in our everyday lives? And I think, Joanna, you got to that when you were talking about um, relationships and all of these ways that thirdness functions in, in everyday life. I know we're just about out of time, um, but it's such a great question. And I think if, you know, with, if there were one word answer, it would be to say, we, we like the idea that attention is in some sense that third thing. 
that we want to keep before us in our worldly encounters. That is every time you're looking at your phone, there's you, there's the phone, and there's that third thing, which is attention. Every time that you're uh, kind of attracted by an ad or by a solicitation, there's you in that thing that wants you, and there's that third thing. So if we could, if we could get that third uh, into the space, we feel that that would have some um, uh, some some genuinely transformative possibility. Wonderful. Well, um, Marianne Peters has a question. She's one of the artists in the show, I should say. Uh, she asks, could you speak to removing the obvious touchstone of authorship for the works as a differentiating focal point? How did that change your choices for the trios, if at all? Now, this is something that we talked about a lot, um, and Marianne Peters, uh, extraordinarily moving um, and, and, and harrowing and uh, and the, the captivating first work really of the exhibition, this trembling turf um, is right in there beside that red wall, the title wall with the text as you enter in. Um, what we well, what there is in the exhibition is a booklet that has all of this information on it. So we are expecting that people can carry this around with them and, and see where the works are from and see who made them. Um, but what what we came to think was that having the tombstones there beside um, beside the works themselves in the first place, even having that information makes you tack between two kinds of understanding and immediately start um, to reclassify what's on the wall based on something else um, that isn't necessarily present. So in a sense, it uh, it adds to the attention solicited in that moment, um, another obligation, which people can feel in all different ways, whether that's um, to act as experts and um, bring in information that you already might know about the, the topic or the time period or the artist, um, or whether it's to feel that you're not an expert and in fact are therefore distant from the experience of viewing because you don't know perhaps what you should um, give in that information. Um, that said, you know, uh, Graham, I can see you, um, there is, and I guess the, the other question there, kind of what, what it is to move away from even this single artist as being the way to organize it, um, is perhaps an understanding that, uh, that, that these, that artists themselves are in conversation with other works as well. And that as, as we spoke about when we looked, um, at that triadic, gathering that to us felt it spoke to the relationship of dream and, and history or dream and historical consciousness. Um, our hope is that by in this exhibition, removing that information one step, putting it in the booklet rather than on the wall um, and allowing artists to sit next to others would make clearer those kinds of conversations that feel to me to always be present there in a visual experience with something. I, I get very excited about this, um, and uh, and it's partly because labels uh, sit in an interesting way between the space of art and the space of science. Uh, Amanda mentioned that I did my PhD in the history and philosophy of science, um, and I actually wrote a piece uh, some of you will know the artist Mark Dion, and I wrote a piece um, for an, a Mark Dion project. He's a, a dear friend and an artist I hugely admire. That's about how labeling moved across from the spaces of scientific knowledge production, natural history museums, the spaces where that kind of didactic, you know, project of instruction uh, was at play for the public. How those labels walked across to kind of art museums. Uh, so there's a kind of a history of labeling in the museum. And I just recently came across a super interesting dissertation by an Italian art historian named Chiara Ianeselli, who did a dissertation on uh, the concept of the untitled work in the 20th century and is now working on um, interestingly enough, a set of sort of neuroscientific and psychological experiments to try to figure out how audience response shifts when you do and don't have labels next to works, which is kind of like, I think, an interesting undertaking. So I would say that labels are so much about translating the encounter with the work into the index 
of positive knowledge, name, title, date, um, that while we wanted that information to be available to people who wanted to encounter it, privileging it, giving it wall space so that it kind of jostles with the object itself, that's really a very specific and historically contingent way of working that I think we were happy to put on pause uh, just for this year. Um, yeah, and that's, a, that's something that the, the Order of the Third Bird, I understand, I mean, they really, strip that out when they're paying attention to works of art. Do you want to talk at all about like the sort of basic protocol that you've surfaced of the, the birds? You, you mentioned a little bit about negating just to kind of put that in context maybe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for joke. yeah, we're we're trying to piece this together from what we've been able to tell. And there's a certain kind of a caginess to the birds in general, um, as well as a mischievous capacity for throwing us off the scent. So we can't really say any of this definitively, but it seems like there is, a, as you said, a basic protocol for attending to artworks. Um, that is a, a, a four, four phases of looking. Um, one of which would kind of move from a very openness to um, uh, to a situation in which one might find oneself with an artwork to a, a moment of concentration or attending to it, to what Graham mentioned, uh, an instance of turning away um, and not turning away perhaps physically, but even more kind of affectively and cognitively turning away from the object um, and then returning to it. Um, so, you know, we've been able to kind of track this this four phase way of looking at artworks um, in various contexts, as well as a bunch of other variations in it. Um, one thing I want to kind of add to that, and maybe to just to to bring a thread forward from the last question. Um, it seems to us both in our interest in these practices and in the exhibition um, that there's nothing dogmatic about this. We're not trying to say that this is the right way to look at works, the only way to look at them, or that somehow an artist of would be better served without the their, um, their peers or their own works alongside it, but rather that this is just an, another way of looking. And our hope is that the hang is, is so, in many ways, um, uh, ostentatiously strange in moments that we're making clear that this is a way of looking. Um, and similarly, that the, the, this order of the third bird might be really developing a way of looking that in its queerness in its um in what might even feel a little bit baroque about elongating and separating out the phases you might go through very fleetingly and, and swiftly in looking um can in fact develop a, a new charged self-consciousness to it but that this is by no means the only way one should or could look at an artwork and find enriching i'm super i don't know like exactly when we have to Pull the plug, but I'm very taken with um, Judith Stitzel's question, which I would love to try to take because it feels super important to go right after that. So um, uh, Judith Stitzel has said, are you all worried that you'll frighten away some museum goers who might otherwise be interested in the question of attention by the esoteric nature of the approach? Um, and I would say that the answer to that is in a basic way, yes. I am worried about that. I worry about that. I think all of us do in different ways. Um, I think that that question is answerable. That is, I think there are things to say. But if the question is, do you worry about that? The answer is yes. Then there would be sort of like, well, what else can be said? Um, we have to see if the show works. And anecdotally, there's a really strong and gratifying sense that though you're getting kind of mainline metafictional intricacy, when you walk into the room, there are things to look at that are puzzling. And what the docents and the um, guards have been saying it's like we've never had a show where people were taking as long in front of the paintings as as this show 
And uh, that was not one, not two, but that was three different cards. We're like, it's definitely peculiar. People are spending a long time in front of these groupings. Um, and that was very gratifying. So it seems like even though people could be put off, it's not like we, they come in and we hand them an 800 page historiographical metafiction and we're like, okay, time to do your homework. What they do is they walk in and they're like, whoa, three things. And hey, I had that old Mac computer that's in the trunk. What's the, and then it, these provide entrees. Um, I'll say one last thing because we have to go, we're being told we have to wrap. And that is um, maybe two if I can. One, um, protocols, formal structures, choreographies of attention, that is becoming self-conscious and thinking of your attention as a medium uh, and that there are notes to be played in it and that someone could give you a score and you could play your attention according to that score. I would say that's been, that's at the heart of Vestar Sarah's project. We love that idea and all our stuff works that idea. And we think that that idea uh, playful, but also interesting. Historical, because there have been protocols that have guided attention like that in the past, some secular, some religious, but we mostly don't think of those any longer in relation to the encounter with artworks. And so surfacing that has proven interesting over the last few years. Um, and then, so that's just to speak to this question of the protocol uh, of attention that, that Joe was going to. And then I'll say lastly, that we're really interested in the different modes of attention that arise under different circumstances. And there is a kind of attention that characterizes the puzzle. Like the puzzle is a solicitation of attention in a certain sort of way. Um, and there are aspects of this installation and this presentation, which uh, Judith Stitzel has rightly said, you could worry are gonna be off-putting, but the same kind of thing that can be off-putting, like for instance, taking a picture and cutting it up into a thousand pieces and giving it to someone, you'd be like, that's really annoying. I'd like to just see the picture, but then it wouldn't be a puzzle. And a puzzle is also very engrossing and people spend much longer on puzzles than they do on Hallmark cards, though the image could be the same thing. And so some of that is sort of in the wager of this exhibition and in the wager of Estar Serre's practice more generally. But thank you so much for that super important question. Thank you both. That was great. Please stand. Go see the show though. You humans are out there. If you've not been, if the fry has not dumped you out of this thing, go see the show. <laughs> yes, the show the is, and buy the book. The show is, it will be up for the next year until October 15th. So plenty of time to go see it. We also have a member tour coming up next month on January 15th. So you can get a closer look then. I want to say thank you to our panelists, Amanda Donnan, Joanna Fiducia, and Dee Graham Burnett for being part of this evening. Um, and thank you to everyone who has made this exhibition possible and this conversation possible. Um, generous support from um, the Kid Awake Fund, additional support provided by the Fry Foundation, and of course, our amazing Fry members. Thank you to you all for your generosity and for joining us this evening. Um, a recording of this program will be made available to you in the next day or so. Um, and if you have any feedback about tonight's program or have a suggestion for future curatorial conversations, please feel free to email membership at frymuseum.org. And with that, thank you all for being part of this installment of Curatorial Conversations. Have a good evening. Thanks, members. Good night. <laughs>